2022. What makes someone a cyborg? Getting cut. Yeah. I'm Barb. And I'm Alex. Welcome to Enchantarium. Coś jeszcze? <laughs> jeszcze raz. In today's video, we are collaborating with Elisa from Moonlight Jewel on another Smart Doll video. For this one, we chose the theme of cyborgs. Let's go! On the Smart Doll website, in the freebie section, you can find a model of a small bust piece, which was an obvious move for this collaboration, as modding a Smart Doll is not exactly something we would want to do. These dolls are pricey and by modding one, we couldn't use it with another blank head to make another character. A big collaborator on this project was my boyfriend, who is a graphic designer and 3D modeler for a game company. He modeled this heart insert in the chest in Maya. I printed it in skin tone water washable resin from Elegoo. The heart is open to allow a small LED light to light it up. I made a quick and dirty circuit with a button type battery, two cables and some electrical tape. And the LED just inserts into these cables, that way there's no switches and soldering involved. To cover the hole, I cut a piece of acrylic, which I sanded down on both sides to make it disperse the light better, and followed that up with a piece of pink vinyl. Then, my overachieving ass decided, you know what would be cool? Robotic gauntlets. Like Vi from League of Legends and the arcane Netflix show I really enjoyed lately. And not only that, I wanted it to be posable. Like every finger to be posable. So that I did. I don't even know how long it took to model. I started in CAD to make all of the moving parts. I thought I would record myself doing it in real time, but ended up with tons of boring footage. Here's some funny bits. The actual mechanical parts were pretty well tuned, so I went on to print them. Here's a few early prototypes. Weird fingers that were too wobbly. Some first editions of the final design, on which I managed to break a drill bit. A working prototype, for which I didn't have the right screws, so it's also wobbly and broken after playing with it too much. A resin prototype finger, you may have seen this on our Instagram. And lastly, the final prints. These were done in Elegoo's ABS-like white resin, which they so kindly sent to us for this project. It is specially designed for reducing shrinkage during the photo curing process, which is really important to me for this model, as the parts have to work together flawlessly. It's also stronger than the regular resin, so I'm hoping the joints won't go loose as easily as in Sula's legs over time. The fingers come together with the tiniest screws I could source for a reasonable price. These are 1.6 millimeters in diameter. The assembly was pretty easy, and although I didn't have all the right lengths of the screws, they cut easily enough. Repeated 10 times over, this process took a good chunk of an evening for me. Now, the rest of the hand was, let's say, goddamn infuriating. I couldn't progress the model on my own in CAD, so I asked my boyfriend to help me again. This is what he came up with. It wasn't exactly it though, so Alex stepped in and also modeled some parts. And after weeks of frustration, going back and forth and crying, we managed to get some prints. And I made these prints hollow to make the gauntlets as light as possible. You can see the resin oozing out of the drainage holes in the upper part of the hand. For the other part, however, some idiot forgot to put the drainage holes in, so the arm pieces had to be drilled into to allow the resin to escape. In the end, I ended up with some mighty fine prints. This is how they will be assembled, but they need to be painted first. After staring at these parts for hours in Blender, I can finally touch them and see how they look in reality. It's an amazing feeling holding in your hands something you were working so hard on. But first, we need to fix the holes Barb made with such passion. I'm going to use epoxy sculpt as it's strong and stiff when cured. I recommend priming the surface of 3D prints, but the only primer we have is grey. And we didn't print these in white to prime them grey and paint them white. Duh. So I sprayed it twice with MSC to have a transparent paper-like texture. The colors I chose for the gauntlets are gold, pink and purple. It took a lot of time to make these colors opaque. Each color required at least three coats of thin watered-down paint, so I can avoid visible brush strokes. I forgot to record the gloss right after painting, but you'll see the end result in Barb's footage later. 
The same treatment goes for a chest piece, designed by my sister's boyfriend. I absolutely adore the style he chose for this modification. If I was to design this chest, I know I would come up with a very different aesthetic and the whole design would turn into a dark themed edgy robot. So I'm thankful we trusted him with the idea and execution, because now we have a super cute cyber girl that looks like taken right out of a stylized video game. To finish the paint job, I covered every painted surface with two coats of acrylic varnish. And while we're in the painting station, let's paint the face. We have a few options to choose from. Mirai Cortex in Milk, Kanata Sculpt in Cinnamon, I already started sketching on this one, and we have two semi-real sculpts, Genesis and Entropy. I envisioned this character as super girly and extremely cute, so I chose Entropy for her soft features and a gentle smile. After two layers of Mr. Super Clear, I start with the watercolor pencils. I really wanted something unusual on her face, like bold makeup or mechanical parts. I'm starting from drawing a big purple cross around one of the eyes and a big thick eyeliner in yellow on the other lid. I want her to look friendly and soft to contrast it with her artificial parts. I'm adding another layer of MSC whenever I feel the surface stops taking the pigment. On another layer, I'm enhancing the colors and adding black to the eyes and lashes. It took me a few times, but eventually I ended up with very straight and thin brows. Now, the cyborg parts. I did a light brown sketch to cut the symmetry and draw over it with a dark grey pencil. I really like the look of futuristic cyberpunk-like thin lines on faces, and I always wanted to make a doll like this, so this collab is a perfect occasion to use this kind of aesthetic. I'm adding white panels to her brows and cheeks, so the face is more coherent with the rest of the design. A few more touches with watercolor pencils and the face of our little cyborg is ready. For her top, I'm keeping it very simple and making a tube out of this light purple velour. I just hemmed the long sides and stitched the short sides together. To complete the top part of the outfit, I am making a vest out of this gold fabric. I sewed the backs right sides together and the fronts to the back at the shoulders. I stitched the side seams as well because I thought it made sense and added a collar. Then I attached the lining to the other side of the collar and folded the whole thing on itself to attach the front edges together. I realized that in order to sew the lining and the main fabric together at the armholes, I needed to take out the side seam, so I did, and sewed around the armhole right sides together. Turning it out was a bit difficult, but doable. I then sewed the side seams back together. I decided to remake the whole thing with a dark purple lining, since it was going to show and I added a zipper to the front edges. To close up the bottom, normally you could flip the whole thing right sides together, but since the vest is cropped and so small, I had to come up with something else, as I didn't have enough room for that. So I basted the layers together and added a white band from purple fabric. Welcome to the vlog segment where we hunt for fabric. We took some samples of the color palette we were going for to the thrift store to pick up some used pants to make the doll's pants. <laughs> Shenanigans were involved and when we got to the store, it didn't really take long to find the perfect yellow fabric to complement the color scheme we picked. We celebrated our success by going to the nearby bakery and getting what we call warm ice cream. A Polish dessert made of egg white based mousse topped by syrup, chocolate and other topping and presented in a waffle cup resembling Italian ice cream and as such giving name to the dessert. To sew the pants, I actually came up with a decent pattern of my own. I cut all of the pieces in two tones of fabric. I'm starting by making pocket flaps by sewing small rectangles of the fabric right sides together along three sides. Flip them out and top stitch around the edge set aside. I wanted to include cargo-like pockets on the side of the pant legs, and to make them, I sewed a long strip of fabric along the three edges of another rectangle. I ironed the opposite edge first and pinned it right sides together to the rectangle. Every time I get to the corner, I will put my needle down and snip the tape diagonally, then pivot both pieces so that the edges match up again. This may take a bit of fiddling, but it should be doable. Trim down the seam allowance and hem the raw edge. Now for the shorts part of the pants. We have to assemble the front pieces by sewing the curves together. This may seem weird, as one curve is convex and the other is concave, but it will work. I snip the seam allowance to allow it for better curving. I pin everything slowly and methodically, approximating the curves to one another. 
When sewing, I kind of pleat the fabric out of the way and here's what I have. I added a top stitch to the seam allowance and I will now draw out the darts, which I like to cut out of the pattern for easy tracing. Sew them up and press. I did the same to the back and now I'm adding the smaller pocket flaps, first right sides together and then top stitching them down so they lay flat. What comes next is regular pants business, which is fronts together at the rise, backs to front at side seams, and hemming the waist and the leg holes. I add top stitching to keep the seam allowance down and for decoration in most places. Next comes the back rise, which is sewn halfway to let the butt in, and the inner leg seam, which almost completes the shorts. I snip, 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 snip this seam for a smoother look and add a closure in the back. I am essentially recreating these pants, so we need to make the pant legs separately. These are made of two two-colored pieces per leg, so I need to join these similarly to how I did the fronts of the shorts. Then two mirroring pieces are joined at the side seam. Both the top and the bottom can be hemmed, and it's time to add the pockets, which gave me some trouble as the fabric was on the thicker side. I mark out the pocket placement and butt the yellow part to the line. The edge has already been pressed inward, so I'm top stitching around the whole thing. It takes a bit of finagling, but we can continue and add the flap of the pocket and stitch it down at the sides towards the top to make it look a little bit flatter. We can close the inner leg seam now, turn the pant leg over and attach them to the shorts at the inner side. To make the gap show better, I stuffed some screws in the pockets to weigh them down. This is how they look. It felt like they were missing something, so I made some iron-on patches to decorate them, which I cut on my Cricut machine. I had a bit of a dance party while waiting and pressed them a bit too long and the pink transferred to the pants. Oh well, I guess that's like blood of her enemies that didn't wash out or something. Yellow is definitely not my favorite color and I don't know why I bought this fiber, but it laid in our stash for at least a year and it's finally the right time to use it. I made glued wefts from these three colors, but before we can do something with it, I need a wig cap. Our beautiful girl Genesis will be a model this time. I'm wrapping the head with a stretchy fabric and applying a few layers of all-purpose glue. After it dried, I'm freeing the head from the cap and trimming it to the right size. To prevent the cap from peeking through, I paint it with acrylic paint in the color of the hair. I'm gluing the wefts one by one starting from the back of the head. When I had two layers, I stopped and started curling the hair using a metal stick and a hair straightener. I added next layers of wefts and also curled them off camera. For the parting wefts, I'm going to use a hair straightener technique and bend them before gluing. The curls turned out super cute, but that's not what I have in mind. I want a big hairstyle with waves to balance those big gauntlets, so I'm splitting and brushing all of the curls. Then they need a little trim. So fluffy! We decided that space buns will be a good choice for this hairstyle. So I'm securing the hair with a wire, twisting it and fixing in place with a yellow thread. I wish I did that before trimming the hair. The buns would come out bigger and fluffier and there's nothing I can do with the length of the fibers now. And well, it turned out we accidentally made a <laughs> delightful hairstyle. <laughs> It's not my first semi-real face-up, but these are going to be my first semi-real eyes. Barb printed these bases for me and I made this eye design on my computer. They were printed on a vinyl paper and are easy to stick to the resin base. Then I'm applying a few layers of UV resin to make that dome effect. It's not my finest work, but I really like how they look on the doll. Barb said she doesn't like how small both irises and pupils are, so I had to redo them. It's important to me that we're both happy with the result, so that was not a problem at all. I made them bigger with bigger pupils and it looks like this. The last outfit part is the shoes. These were almost directly pulled from the Artifact Challenge shoe model I found online. My lovely boyfriend helped me with this again. He's like a 3D model magician to me. He took the model, made a last for me, fixed the sole file so it could be printed, and pulled out what's called UV maps of the different parts of the model so they could be turned into a pattern for the upper in Illustrator later. 
Illustrator later, alligator. <laughs> Somebody stop me. I cut all of the parts and interface them so we can begin assembling the shoe. I first glued down all of the edges that needed to look finished. I recently found this Uhu glue, which I know Elisa uses in her customizing, so I decided to give it a try and I gotta say, I'm hooked. Probably because of the fumes. These shoes, for the most part, are just made with this glue. There were two parts that needed to be sewn right sides together and that is the tongue and the main back piece. I stitched around all of these sewn pieces and glued pieces to make them more secure. I have the pieces all laid out and a note with the order of operations so I'm not confused. I printed the lasts on my ender since I just needed the basic form of the shoe and I taped up the bottom to get the shape of the sole. I cut these out of cardstock and glued pink cotton to them wrapping it around the edges to the bottom. I drew out the seam allowance and start assembling the tip of the shoe, forming it into a domed shape. I felt like this was the most difficult part to get right. I glued in the tongue and this piece is ready for now. Next, I assembled the back portion of the shoe, layering the pieces just like on the reference model. I skipped some of the elements of the original because they would be just too small for the doll scale. I glued the fronts to the back and it was time to assemble it on the last. I used a piece of masking tape to temporarily hold the sole to the last and began gluing the excess of the upper to the bottom of the sole, sewing it down for a tight fit. When the glue dried a bit, I added the last four pieces which will hold the laces later. In retrospect, I should have added more of the details like this, just being glued in one spot and loose in the others. I think it would work a bit better. I marked out the eyelet positions with a removable pen and tried to cut the holes out which was pretty darn difficult, as there were a lot of layers and the fabric I chose, although the right color, was very thick. I managed to put the eyelets in eventually. The last piece of this puzzle is the sole, which I printed in the same white resin from Elegoo to match the aesthetic. Using a generous amount of glue, I pressed the uppers in. I laced the shoes with a flat white elastic, but later I changed it to a ribbon, which you can see in the back while I show you the finished painted and glued chest piece. It's time for the star of the show, the final assembly of the gauntlets. First, in order to make sure the gauntlets don't fall off, we need to drill out the doll's hands. I designed it this way so that the arm goes in and will be held with a screw. Don't worry, the hands will still work without the gauntlets, as the hole is not big and doesn't disrupt putting the regular hands on them. I had a bit of a problem sourcing these M3 screws in my local hardware store, so I had to use what I have on hand. These don't go all the way through to the other side to be secured with a nut, but it's not necessary as this is not a joint. Next, I will connect all of the fingers. The thumb went in alright, but for the other fingers, I didn't have enough space to hold the nut with my finger, so I had to glue them in before I could screw them in. Woohoo glue to the rescue! I carefully put all of the fingers in and the moment of truth. Do they move? And the answer is yes. I was so relieved it all worked properly. The last joint is the wrist joint. I used my power drill to drive the screws this time, as they were finally big enough to do that. These screws were not available in the shop, so I had to use these longer ones, but at least I managed to buy these yes. nuts, which I didn't have on hand. With that secured, my friends, we are done. This is how she turned out. I sincerely hope you guys love her as much as we do. I feel like the more turmoil there is during the project, the better it turns out. And that's not something I would like to keep up with because the modeling on this one took a mental toll on both of us and my boyfriend too. It's hard to not try to beat ourselves with the next project as we want to make them exciting for you every time you come back to our channel. And it feels like it's going to be tough to make something bigger and better next time. Anyways, we decided to name her Coco as in double knockout, and Kokoro in Japanese means heart, like the one she has on her chest. And with her hair, she kinda looks like a chicken. And in Polish, the sound that chicken makes is... Ko -ko 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 -ko. <laughs> <laughs> what is the chicken sound in your language? Let us know in the comments down below! 
This video is a collaboration with our friend Elisa from Moonlight Joel, so make sure you check out her amazing cyberpunk style cyborg doll as well. Her video is linked down below. Thanks again to Elisa from Moonlight Joel for collaborating with us. Thanks to my boyfriend who did a lot of work for us this time. And thanks to Elagu for sponsoring the resin for this project. By the way, the 3D models will be available on our Thingiverse and there's a tip option there. And my boyfriend is a pretty expensive 3D modeler, so if you would like to help me pay him, please tip. Thank you. <laughs> Make sure to follow us on Instagram for some sneak peeks and subscribe for future videos. Have an enchanted day and we'll see you next time. Bye. What makes blah? What makes blah? Blah. Basha makes blah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah.